Hi. Good morning. So I guess uh, this must be the people who didn't go to the party last night. Huh? Everyone else, perhaps. You know, nine o'clock in the morning, right after the party, this is the best part. <laughs> so uh, my name is Tariq Khan, uh, and I'm here with uh, my colleague uh, Arun Tulasi. Hello. Yeah. So we're part of uh, HP's uh, Network Functions Virtualization Business Unit and uh, been working with the, with the cloud and OpenStack uh, pretty much since it started and for the last couple of years focusing on how, how we, can, we can start using OpenStack for, for virtualizing the network functions. Uh, I know a couple of people in the room uh, have been working on it quite a bit. So uh, for them, maybe some of what we're talking about is not going to be as new, but I uh, hope the others are able to get uh, something out of it. So the topic today is uh, a rather narrow topic where we're essentially trying to look at the problem of being able to get uh, accelerated ne network performance uh, within OpenStack and, uh, and then uh, look for, talk about a little bit of options and then you know, close out with uh, what solutions uh, HP has and how we are trying to, to uh, solve this problem for, for carriers, especially in a in a carrier-grade production quality OpenStack distribution. So with that, uh, we're going to get started. So the first, uh, I wanted to open it up with, uh, with uh, uh, something, just a reminder of why we need accelerated performance. I know uh, almost everyone perhaps knows it, but we wanted to open it up. Then I uh, wanted to just talk a little bit about what options are there. And if you take uh, everything away, there's, uh, you know, at the heart of it, there's just a couple of ways of going about it, and there's different implementations of, of addressing those, those ways. Um, then we were going to talk about where is OpenStack with it and some of the other efforts going on in providing uh, this uh, accelerated performance, and then uh, close it out, as I said earlier, with uh, our solutions. So with that, uh, um, getting started, and I'm sure so everyone has seen it. Has anyone not seen this? Probably not. So this is all, any uh, NFE discussion starts with this. What are we doing? Instead of building the uh, monolithic uh, large network systems, which have essentially are the mainframes of network, instead of having a single company providing the, the hardware, the quote-unquote operating system, and the applications, why not try to use uh, the abstraction that, that cloud technologies provide and then be able to have just the functions, i.e. the network applications, be deployed to it. So what it boils down to at a, at a hardware level is that you had dedicated systems that you were using earlier. Now these are not dedicated anymore. You are, and you're introducing some new, some new component which weren't there in the, the, the traditional network devices. And what, what that happens is, and you know, such technical questions and, and comments over here, but what that it really introduces it, earlier you had the full use of the resources, so the, the uh, network operating systems, they didn't have to worry about you know, protecting the memory, going from you know, kernel space to the user space, trying to make sure that you don't have too many copies of, uh, of the uh, data packets. All of those problems weren't there, but now you have, you have to share resources with other workloads. And uh, but as part of the sharing resources, you have, you have to go back to some basics of how, how operating systems and servers work. You know, there's interrupts that come in when, when you need to be able to do things. There's uh, other, other processes that are vying for the processor and I.O. time. And, and then to be able to solve it, the, the you know, OpenStack, within OpenStack, Open vSwitch pretty much has become the de facto vSwitch. I know there's a number of other options available, but, but this is uh, predominantly over 90% of the deployments are using Open vSwitch in some shape or form. And uh, it's providing a very flexible environment, a full featured vSwitch, but, but to be able to, to deploy it for OpenStack, there was some complexity that was put in place essentially to, to have the agility and to be able to, to move things around. And, and as you can see, and these are the different tap ports that you're able to do it. The VMs don't, don't go straight to, to, the, to the vSwitch. You go through Linux Bridge, and, and uh, essentially the more things you're going to add, the more copies that, that are introduced. And 
As a result, when there's a packet that needs to go from, from one VM to a VM on a different host, you essentially have to go sometimes, as much, not sometimes, a minimum of nine copies have to happen. And these nine copies, and if you look at a traditional operating system, each of these copies requires an interrupt. The processor needs to be interrupted. It needs to be copied. When we are talking about the, some of the data plane intensive apps, some of the signaling apps that, that are there powering our cell phones, and especially when some of these have uh, um, the, the, the uh, packet signaling packet for these phones is about 60 bytes in, in, in size. And if you have those 60 byte packets, each of these having to go, you know, nine copies to go from one side to the other one, it's going to create latency and it's going to pr put a lot of overhead on the, on the processor. Whereas they were used to be able to doing these with a normal TCAM based, uh, ASIC based uh, switch, just three copies against these nine copies. And to be able to do this, uh, I'm going to hand it over to, to my colleague Arun, who's going to talk a little bit about, you know, what are the options for, for addressing these uh, nine copies against something else. Thanks, Tariq. So, uh, Tariq talked about the distinction between what an enterprise environment typically requires and what category environments need. So, uh, with the current open vSwitch uh, and, and the kind of package that we see in, in typical telco environments, we'd be lucky to get, you know, 30 or 40 percent of the available bandwidth through the open vSwitch. Let's say you have a 10 gig NIC you're going to get as good as, you know, four gigs, three and a half gigs. The goal for us is to be able to get as close to wire speed as we can get because, uh, you know, you, you open up your phone, you want to get a stock code, it gets slower, people get unhappy. So what are the options that are available for us today? One uh, is the ability to take out the slow switch and have what we're going to call, quote, unquote, a faster switch. You know, what that faster switch is, we'll be looking at in the next couple of slides. Or the other option is, to completely bypass the switch and be able to use the underlying hardware and the capabilities that it provides, uh, what we're going to call PCA pass-through and SRIOV, uh, similar uh, to an extent, but have, uh, they have some key differences. But each approach comes with a, a cost of its own. Uh, if, you, if you need a new switch, you're probably going to have to acquire something that's different from what the community provides uh, as Open vSwitch, or either have Open vSwitch in itself uh, enhanced. On the on the other hand, if you if you want SRIOV or PCA pass through capabilities, you most definitely need new hardware and in certain cases possible drivers uh, that support these technologies. So e each of these options uh, comes with a cost uh, that you need to incur. So uh, what does what does a faster V switch mean? Uh, again, as Tariq pointed out earlier. The major reason why we lose out on bandwidth is, is the number of copies that are involved going from user space to kernel space, back from kernel space to user space, and so forth. A kernel bypass technology, and this example uses DPDK, a kernel bypass technology is our gateway to get those copies eliminated and have the kind of performance we desire regardless of the packet size. So if you're running jumbo frames, probably you have less a number of copies, but if you go uh, for these kind of uh, smaller packets, then uh, your copies just, uh, just multiply. So if, if you look at what DPDK is trying to accomplish, it's trying to eliminate the additional copies that are required. So DPDK requires applications to be recompiled with certain options enabled. There are other technologies that do not require uh, the applications to be recompiled as well. But the underlying goal is to make sure that the application can use a user space driver that can directly talk to an enabled NIC, you know, DPDK or Open Onload or any other technology that you desire. So that's, that's one way for us to move from a slower switch uh, to a faster switch. So on the hardware side, uh, we talked about two options, PCA pass-through and SRIOV. And one of the biggest differences between uh, these two is how uh, a NIC is visible uh, to the VMs on top. PCA pass-through effectively allows you access to the functions, the physical function of the NIC from the VM. So in essence, if you're going to have four VMs, they typically need one NIC of their own. But again, going back to some of the telco basics, 
each VM is going to require multiple NICs. Each host is required to host multiple VMs. So PCA pass-through in itself might not be an ideal choice for all your VNFs. So that's the reason we have SRIOV. So SRIOV enhances PCA pass-through capabilities in that it allows your VM to talk to a virtual function that can go from 1 to 64 uh, on your physical NICs, where each virtual function inside a NIC is exposed to a VM, possibly as a VNIC. So this allows you to talk directly to the, to the NIC without having to go through a vSwitch. And it also allows you uh, a number of different VMs to be hosted on the same server. So if you, if you look at uh, the example here, so VM1 and VM0 effectively talk to the same shared resource, which is a single NIC, which is an SRIOV capable NIC. But it exposes up to 64 virtual functions, each of which is effectively embedded uh, into the domain XML file of the VM itself. So uh, in, 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 an, in an ideal world, we do not want uh, customers to be restricted by using just one technology or the other. Y you need to have a compute host which should provide you a variety of different options to accelerate your networking performance. The VMs that you deploy on top should be, should be free to choose which mechanism suits them the best. Do they want to work through SRIOV? Because SRIOV, as we understand, has you know, certain limitations or certain challenges around migrations and so forth, or can it use AVS and the flexibility that it provides? So a typical compute host should be able to provide you both the capability to use vSwitch or the capability to use a technology such as SRIOV. And as you can see in the slide here, each VM effectively has its own networking mechanism. You could go through uh, the vSwitch uh, as part of your uh, acceleration process or you could directly uh, access the virtual function uh, of the NIC. So we, we, we talked about uh, some of the primary models. We, we did not touch on all the available options. There are some options that, that are still gathering traction, you know, RDMA, Rocky, and the other options. But what today is available for you to order uh, and be able to seamlessly deploy your current applications, we talked about it. So what is, what is OpenStack doing uh, to support these technologies that we saw. Where are we with respect to you know, what the community is doing for either SRIOV or PCA pass-through or some kind of enhanced vSwitch? So uh, SRIOV uh, has gained uh, good traction with, uh, with OpenStack. You could do SRIOV with upstream OpenStack today. Uh, it's been available since Juno. You know, it's, it's being enhanced as we speak. Uh, in Kilo, it's going to have additional enhancements, both Nova and Neutron are enabled to work with SRIOV ports. So you could, uh, you, could, you could add, you could create a VM, plug in any Neutron port you want, and, SR, and NOVA will support and recognize an SRIOV port. Uh, same way for uh, Neutron as well. Uh, but the key challenge uh, that we see today is, you know, live migration. So in, in a cloud native world, you probably do not rely as much on live migration. You expect the applications to be inherently aware. You expect the applications to be redundant. You don't care about live migration. But uh, as a telco, that transition does not happen overnight. You do have applications where you are heavily invested in that require the platform to provide HA. So until you get to the day where your applications are all HA aware, you, know, you can throw in Chaos Monkey and your applications will still be up, you need a pathway uh, to use, and, and live migration is key. So today, SRIV and live migration don't, don't go hand in hand. So that's something, you know, as, as members of the community, as partners in the community, uh, we need to look at. Uh, that provides a pathway, you know, the flexibility that we talked about in the earlier slide. I bring up a VM, I'd be able to choose AVS or SRIV and still get the kind of functionality and availability I need. Uh, and also, uh, the capabilities of NICs. So today, there are a handful of NICs, I think, that are being supported within upstream. I, I think Intel and Mellanox are probably the two well-known NICs that do SRIOV and function well with upstream OpenStack. We definitely need you know, some kind of ubiquitous NIC support. I, I should be able to, you know, if, if I'm talking about platforms like Open Computer and whatnot, 
I should be able to have other NICs identified and other NICs supported uh, in the community. Uh, PCA pass-through, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, as weird as it sounds, it's a subset of SRAV in that it, it essentially exposes one function where SRAV exposes multiple, uh, leaving alone some of the other differences. Uh, but as long as we could get SRIUV going with the flexibility that it offers, we should still be okay getting, uh, getting the telcos yeah. moving on. And, and Arun, just to add, the uh, other challenges with SRIUV that, that we have right now is that oh, in this one, since you are bypassing the vSwitch, you're essentially your VM is connecting to a physical network directly. And, and what that requires is that now in your, you're in any scale deployment, you, you will need to include some kind of control or SDN capabilities where, where you want to be able to, if you want to create a new VLAN, for example, on your, with, with, the, with a vSwitch-based deployment, your VLANs are created within the, you can create them using your vSwitch and the integration is there. But now that, that all the network activities need to happen on the physical network, you need to make sure that your physical network is controllable through Neutron. So you need to figure out, you know, either control them directly with the, with the vendor's Neutron plug plugins, or you abstract it away using some kind of SDN controller. So there's work going on in this, but, but it, uh, there, there's, like uh, Arun talked about, there's pros and cons that we want to be, we're, we're going to have. So in an ideal world, we want where we need that, that accelerated performance, near line speed with, with low CPU overhead, we want to use SRI via bypass technology. Where we don't, for example, for almost uh, all VNFs that we deploy, there's a ONM port, there's uh, you know, other control ports where you don't need it, so you can't want to be able to use some vSwitch-based uh, based, uh, technology. Yeah, I'll, I'll swear by vSwitch any day, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, go, go back to our discussion. Uh, you know, uh, as we talked about SROV, uh, we need to address uh, OVS as well. So uh, one of the good things about deploying upstream OpenStack is it is well integrated with OVS, so I'd, I'd be able to just get a deployment uh, going in hours. But, uh, you know, we talked about this earlier. The performance out of OVS uh, does not meet uh, carry needs by any means. Uh, even enterprises uh, would have challenges, carriers uh, by no means. So there has to be a way for OVS uh, to be enhanced to work with some kind of kernel bypass enablement mechanism. Uh, it could be DPDK, it could be open on load, it could be something else the community comes up with. But as critical as, something as critical as open vSwitch that is required for OpenStack to fully function, I think we as a community need to be able to influence that decision and have OVS uh, ready for uh, you know, any one of the mechanisms uh, that we identify as a community. Uh, the, the second challenge with any of these new technologies is how does it impact the application that's already deployed? Uh, some telcos develop applications of their own. They are constantly uh, deployed, so it's easier for you to go in, make some change, and have it work with any new environment. But when you work with a partner, when you work with a legacy application, how easy would it be uh, for us to go in, make some changes to either recompile the application or add a new driver uh, to the host or the VM? So these are challenges uh, that we are facing today. Uh, how do we ensure application work well in this new framework that we build out? So you know, there has to be, again, a, a community-driven effort to minimize those kind of restrictions on the VNF providers, uh, having the applications enabled for these technologies without a recompile or any cumbersome procedure. Uh, lastly, there are, there are various different vSwitches that are in the market. There are, there are customers who have taken, for instance, OVS, they have built their own additional technologies on top. How do we bring them back into the community? How do we, how do we ensure you know, whatever work has been going on in, in different spheres uh, flows back into the product itself so that you know, what, what external vendors get, uh, any upstream user uh, would eventually be able to get. Uh, that said, I'll pass it back to Tariq to talk about how we as HP are trying to address this yeah. problem. <coughs> so thank you, Aaron. Uh, so I so, um, wanted to take just a couple of minutes talking about uh, our, our solutions in this area. And our solutions, uh, we, HP being an engineering company uh, at heart, 
you know, before we start working on it, we have to agree on the strategy and then everything has to align back. Just a normal architecture principle. Everyone follows them, right? Um, so the, the vision that we put together was that, that the, and, and this is not just for telco, this is, you know, in general, we, we and just the attestation of, uh, you know, 5,000 people showing over here, is the fact that uh, people have acknowledged that open source is going to play a big role in the IT of future. And, and it's going to be a developer-led world, which essentially means that when you're trying to be able to interact with, uh, with uh, uh, any IT systems, you've got to be able to use some kind of APIs to be able to, to uh, address that. So this is something that at HP we have completely internalized. And, and uh, all our solutions are, are working towards it, obviously, OpenStack being a big part of it. And the other thing that we are, we are trying to enable is, how can we bring the IT style agility and cost structures, not necessarily cost uh, the actual pricing, but cost structures into the telco. And, and if you look at it, the telco cost structures used to be very different. I mean, they're still very different, but the IT style essentially means that that the product, the solutions that are being developed, they're developed not for a small cross-section of customers, but a very wide, where the development cost is amortized across all of those uh, development engineering support costs. So this is what we are, we are trying to enable. And to be able to enable it, uh, we have some, some of these core technologies. So we have, and as you know, most folks over here can attest that, that the the worlds within the network uh, providers, the uh, CSPs, it is coalescing into a single organization that that will be providing both IT and network services. And and the the when when all of these services are provided, then what you want to be able to do is that there are certain applications which have very you know IT style requirements where you don't need this accelerator acceleration like uh, Arun talked about. But there are some some applications the 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 ones that I you know, kind of talked about. Uh, the, the what's called as a bearer applications or a data plane intensive applications will require uh, something which is very focused on 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 uh, on ensuring that the 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 packet can come in and out as as quickly as possible near line uh, near uh, uh, near line speeds. So all of these need to be able. The vision is that we want to be able to get together where you you have a single control plane and across the single control plane, based on the requirement characteristics of their workload, you're able to to position it uh, appropriately. So for this, uh, there's I think this is just a subset of different uh, standards bodies uh, or uh, open source organizations that are working on it. Uh, we have been very active in it, and I know you know again attestation that. You guys are active in it, but that's why you're here. Um, so so where we, the way we are working on it is that as for you to be able to have an OpenStack distribution, you've got to be able to, to use, put the guidelines in place and ensure that you're, you're not creating yet another fork of which, which happened in Linux and a lot of other uh, open source solutions. So, so we are completely aligned with you know what OpenStar.org essentially has has put the the guidelines together, but wherever there's there's some capability that needs to be developed, there's only so many ways of doing it. Either you put a new blueprint, work with the community to get it included, or you you use the pluggable architecture that OpenStack provides and be able to to create those plugins so that you you're using the OpenStack API endpoints instead of coming up with yet another endpoint. And then there are certain things that OpenStack has left it open. Um, being able to, to use what flavor of Linux you're going to use, what vSwitch, and it just being the pluggable architecture, you've got to be able to build some value around it, which is what, uh, what at HP we are doing, and we are upstreaming anything that, that's coming out. So this one, just an eye chart, just wanted to uh, leave it over here that HP Helion is, is a brand. It has a number of different products. There's a couple of products that, that are very focused on OpenStack that uh, we are, we're talking about over here. So there's an enterprise version of OpenStack that, that we have, and there's a carrier grade version of OpenStack that we have. And it's in the carrier grade version where we are essentially trying to bring some of these capabilities that are very, very important to, uh, to uh, these network workloads. And the way we are building our solutions is like anyone else builds it. You've got to start with core OpenStack. It is coming from the OpenStack trunk. Then you put some value around it. And the value that, that uh, 
you know, each distribution provider, obviously including us, we are putting around it to be able to do the lifecycle management of the platform itself. OpenStack, for example, has not said how should you install it, how should you get it up and running, how do you update it, what kind of security policies do you put in place within your, your compute node, your servers, and so on and so forth. So we, we are putting that together. And, and with these configuration management, lifecycle management capabilities, we bring in as, as Helion OpenStack, which is the, the enterprise version of our, of, of our distribution. Um, then taking that as base, we are able to, to add capabilities that are only important to, to telcos to it. Now, quite likely, these capabilities are going to make into mainstream pretty quickly. Uh, someone used the example that uh, you know, there, there is a model that cars, uh, car auto manufacturers use quite a bit, that any new capability that you bring in, you bring in in, in your premium line. And then you know, those capabilities are available everywhere. Uh, so I like uh, my wife drives a Prius. And that Prius has adaptive cruise control. It has le lane keep assist, which uh, just a couple of years ago were only available uh, for at you know the the highest uh, you know luxury car models. Which is the same thing that's happening over here as well. The the capability is moving down here. And then we are we have, uh, put an umbrella of uh, uh, the the services. So anything that's not available in the product, the anything that needs to be customized for a specific uh, customer. We are able to do it with both professional services and uh, a global support organization that we are providing. So uh, now that kind of I set the stage of how this premium version of OpenStack is, is structured, just wanted to call out at a very high level what the difference is between the telco and the compute workloads are. And I know each, each line over there, we can, we can discuss it, and there's going to be nuances around it. But at the heart of it, the best network is where you don't know there's a network. That, and that is what the, 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 the core difference between, between compute and networking workload did. When you go use the compute workload, you're essentially going to an endpoint. You go to a website. When you're using network, you're basically using the network to go somewhere else. So, and, and then, in fact, the next talk, uh, I've got to put a plug on it, is, is around uh, the wireline service on how do you basically go from point A to point B, create the, the, what's called as a virtualized CPE, so which, which essentially shows that the network, we may want, want to show it as a you know, big cloud, but it's really, you know, network has a shape. There are things that are distributed, and, and which, which in, in enterprise workload, you want to be able to aggregate it. You don't want to know the shape, whereas in network, you need to know the shape to be able to, to use it appropriately. So uh, I was having these uh, couple of conversations, and uh, I would love to get the feedback of, uh, of the carriers over here. Um, the the uh, question of what is carrier grade kind of comes up quite a bit. Um, for, for Linux, there's no question, because Linux Foundation came and put the carrier grade specification there. So for, for someone to call their Linux distribution at carrier grade, it needs to pass through or comply with that specification. The last specification is version 5, which came out, I believe, in 2011. But so for up to that point, there is a carrier grade specification. But beyond that, there's no carrier grade specification. So this is our definition of what carrier grade is. And I'd love to get your feedback on if you know, this definition aligns with yours, which really boils down to these three, top, uh, three, three topics. One, it's talked about quite a lot. You know, people align the carrier grade to be with resiliency, you know, five nines or above availability. And what do we mean by that? It, this availability means both in the platform, which is the compute, the, the OpenStack services need to be five nines or above available, and they need to be able to provide these self-healing healing capabilities that VNFs or applications can leverage to be able to provide the end service that people care about to be five nines or above available. Uh, performance, essentially saying, and then what uh, we touched on earlier, that how can you get near line rate? So for you to be carrier grade, you've got to be able to get as close as possible to a line rate performance. And the third thing kind of goes into that these networks that are running, these are, you know, these are the lifeline for so many things. So you've got to be able to have these manageability capabilities, which uh, I know uh, 
if how many of you got a chance to sit in uh, in the talk about uh, upgrading OpenStack, how how easy or hard it is. Um, so the in-service software update capability is a requirement. Now there's multiple ways of doing it, but you got to be able to support it. And there's other capabilities of of uh, when you use these these exploration technologies. Sometimes you have to share the memory or share some other resources, so it requires some enhanced security that you put around it so that uh, uh, you're, you're not uh, giving up one thing for, for being able to get something else. And the advanced resource scheduling, which essentially means that you, because network has a shape, you need to be able to, to schedule your VMs or workloads where it makes sense. In certain cases, you want to schedule them, them separately for high availability. In certain cases, you want to set, schedule them close together for, for low latency. So when you take these three things together, then we essentially can say that the platform is, is carrier grade. And to bring this, uh, HP, we, we partnered with, uh, with Wind River to be able to bring some of the carrier grade Linux capabilities, essentially the compute nodes and the host operating system that you're running, and with the work that we have been doing with the community over here, uh, the OpenStack work from HP, and making sure that when we bring these two things together, that we are able to stay true to OpenStack uh, principles and be able to upstream any, any or, uh, modifications or any updates that we are making to OpenStack. And, and the way that we, are, we, we build this solution together was, as, as Arun talked about, that if we are going to be able to support, we'll have to support for these data plane intensive app, you've got to start from, from the hardware, and the hardware needs to be able to support these, these uh, offload technologies. And then, when you start working on the software layer on top of it, the, the, the only way the IT style cost structures and, and the agility is going to be possible is for, you, for us to be able to leverage what's happening in community, especially around open source. So you, so you start with the open source projects be it OpenStack, be it the carrier grade Linux, or be it the, the KVM extensions that you need to put in place, the real-time extensions, some, some patches that are sitting outside of Linux kernel to be able to make sure that the kernel is uh, preemptible or non-preemptible. And, and once you have these, these uh, enhancements in place, now you're able to, to, number one, have lower latency, but more important that you're able to reduce the jitter. And, and have more predictable performance with these uh, real-time extensions. And real-time extensions really mean that you're, you're getting rid of the buffering. You, you essentially, the, the, the processor is, uh, is uh, addressing the request coming in in real time. And, and then when, once you're able to do it, the, the, you need a vSwitch that, that provides both accelerated workload, accelerated networking performance, and also the vSwitch to be able to provide quote unquote, carrier grade or resiliency that that carriers, carrier grade requires. So you're able to do things like that if there's a fault that happens in the, v, uh, in, in the NIC, you need to be able to pass it all the way through so that the application that's running, that can make real-time decisions on, on, on any, any errors that, that may be coming. Things like making sure that you don't have uh, have uh, memory leaks, you don't have to restart your, your vSwitch very often. Now for, for this, this release, it is a closed source solution. Uh, it's called accelerated vSwitch, but it is a DPDK enabled user space, DPDK enabled vSwitch that's able to, to, to reduce the number of copies uh, in the host and then using with a, with a DPDK pull mode driver in the, in the VM, we're able to get as close to uh, line speed as possible. And, and then, uh, like I talked about, you basically are able to leverage this using DPDK, uh, using a, a NIC driver in the VM. And once you have the NIC driver, you essentially are able to, to uh, run pretty much any operating system. Now, the, this was just related to, to the acceleration. But for carrier grade capabilities that I touched on earlier, you do need some other capabilities as well, which the middleware part provides. Things like uh, high availability and sub-second fault, uh, fault detection, and in some cases, sub-second fault recovery as well. By the way, there is a demo at the, uh, at the HP booth, so if you're around, please, please stop by and we'll be able to see how you know, this, uh, some of these capabilities are, are working on live systems. So when you put all of these things in place, 
and you, you are able to, to schedule the VMs properly and being able to, to assign a specific uh, uh, number of cores to the vSwitch and to the kernel, the, the benefits are phenomenal that you have a significant decrease in average latency, which is important, especially like we talked about, uh, you know, for a 60-byte packet and for a cell phone where the, one of the 3GPP requirements is that when you are trying to register your cell phone, it needs to happen within, within 200 milliseconds. And for 200 milliseconds, if we talk about so many copies, and if you're using you know, this kind of environment, so you, you need to be able to reduce the latency because if, uh, I believe, uh, and Fred, you may know offhand, I believe, what is it? When we power our, our phone on, it touches 70 to more than 70 systems before the, the carrier is able to validate that I am Tarek, I have paid my bill, and I'm a, supposed to be able to use my phone. So what, for those 70 copies, all, all of that needs to happen in 200 milliseconds. So if I'm not able to reduce it, it's going to have, uh, have an impact. And so definitely the latency we are able to reduce, but the more important that we are able to reduce the jitter, which is the variance in, in what we're getting. And these, this is what you're able to get by, by essentially able to use a real-time, or what we're calling carrier-grade KVM. It's uh, some patches that you need to be able to apply to, to the uh, uh, kernel.org KVM. And very interesting story why it's not uh, part of uh, the, the trunk of kernel. Um, then you need to have a user space DPDK-enabled switch for providing some of this, uh, this level of uh, of performance and uh, just some numbers now I completely understand that you know there's vendors putting numbers out everyone looks at those numbers and like okay, yeah you did it in your lab let's see how it's gonna work on on my uh, uh, my floor but but with that said these numbers the testing that we did we when and by the way this is just an example of showing that you can run any host operating system it doesn't mean that a specific performance is only possible with a specific, uh, sorry, guest operating system. But what we are able to do is that just being able to use a d user space DPDK switch, V switch, and and using a, a a kernel driver in the VM, you're able to get something around you know seven to ten times acceleration and performance for a standard packet size of let's say around 256 bytes. But when you are able to put pull mode driver over here, which is how you, how you use DPDK, it's a specific driver that you put in the VM. Uh, a trivial change in terms of coding, just four or five co lines of code and, and inclusion of a DPDK library, but yes, it does require a recompile of the application. But if you do do that, then you're able to get close to what we are saying around, you know, uh, 40 times performance. But as you see, you know, from 256 byte frame size, and above, you're essentially, with this pole mode driver, you're able to run at line speed, two NICs, line speed, just using two cores. And, and which is very important, because if you try to do it with, with a non-DPDK enabled, then, in fact, my next slide kind of shows it, that if you're using an upstream OVS, then just to be able to get about six million packets per second, and at uh, 256 byte, you essentially end up using 20 cores just for vSwitch, just to handle switching. So for a 24 core uh, server, which are very common these days, 12 cores uh, running, you're left with you know, just two or three cores to actually run the VMs. With this one, you're able to, to get, uh, just apply you know, so many cores to the, to the uh, host kernel to the vSwitch, rest of all of these are available for you to be able to run your VMs. So not only it's providing accelerated networking performance, you're able to increase the VM density drastically, which has, a, uh, has quite a bit of impact in, in, in your uh, overall uh, cost of ownership. And just wanted to uh, close out with one, one more slide, and uh, just uh, some, some capabilities that, that some of these, uh, the, the enhancements are able to bring over OpenStack, and uh, happy to, again, uh, show you some of these things at our, at our demo downstairs, being able to 
detect a fault in sub-second, isolate the fault, and then be able to, to uh, recover and repair in, in uh, these kind of time frames. And then being able to uh, have the network failure detection down to 50 millisecond, which, by the way, is a requirement for, for a Linux to be carrier grade. So bringing it down to that level. And then being able to bring some of the, the capabilities like uh, you know, being able to do live migration, not of just normal VMs, but DPDK-enabled VMs as well. Which, uh, which is quite, uh, it's a little challenging doing, uh, doing in uh, some of the upstream uh, uh, capabilities that are available. And with this, uh, I know I'm a minute over, but uh, just wanted to uh, close out that some of the challenges we talked about, how the, our solution is able to address. And yes, any of the changes that we're making to OpenStack to, to uh, bring these, we, we at HP are committed to, to take all of these upstream. Thank you very much, and I'm open to questions. <laughs> yes. The, the, the numbers you're quoting. Mm -hmm. what, what's the topology of that network? And in particular, are you doing layer three? Or is this just between two things sitting in the same subnet attached so to a V switch? I'm sorry. Um, so the, the question is, what is the topology of the network? When you're quoting these throughput numbers, mm -hmm. where is the from and where is the to? And in particular, are you doing layer three or are you just quoting throughput within the same subnet? No, so these numbers are based on measured at the edge of the host operating system. And these are, are just packet in and back. So we're not doing layer three. So it's packet in and back. And so in reality, you know, these numbers would be slightly different, but over here we're saying how much your vSwitch is able to address. Slightly meaning a factor of 10 or 20? So in, in any real network, mm -hmm. it's not in and out on the same subnet, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's traversing routed hops. Yeah. What, what do you envision happening once you have to leave your, your very, very local subnet no, and so, actually so traverse the net? Uh, Right. No, no, I, I, I'm saying your source and destination will, will rarely be on, on the, the same subnet. So the solution still, uh, it's, it still allows for network latency, right? so whatever happens on the network is, is independent latency. What we are trying to ensure is when you hit the, when you are on the host, when the, when the host has a capability of, let's say, 40 gigs, can we get near wireline speed out of the host itself? And that's what these kernel bypass technologies help us accomplish. There is no latency for the packet getting out of the host. So whatever happens on the larger network... So you're, you know, you're, you're assuming that the L3 is handled non-virtualized. The L3 is on a traditional um, Cisco or Juniper or, or Arista router. Is uh, that correct? The L so the L3, the L3 latency in itself is, is not what kernel bypass addresses. So what kernel bypass addresses is, can I get the maximum throughput out of my host when I get in a packet, when I send a packet out? Now, to your point, yes. If you want to have throughput throughout the network, then there are additional components that need to fit in the network. Like, for yeah. instance, a non-virtualized L3 router. But that goes beyond you know, what the data center itself is. Uh, I know. Yes. I mean, so let me try. So if, if you have uh, BNF to BNF communication, which is uh, which is what we're talking about, right? Which was the point that you were going. Right. You will get this at wide speed. If those VNFs are in different subnets, or only if no, they're in the same you subnet. Need to put them at, so it's basically communicating with BNF with the same. Uh, right. So so I, that problem is. I mean, we haven't seen the use case where you need to put them in different subnets for a VNF that actually gets satisfied. We have other technologies that, uh, that we, we bring in with the gateways and so on, which basically will degrade the performance, but not as much as factor of 10. Okay, and we can show you those numbers too. Okay. Um, so, so that's the second thing. The, the third thing, which is uh, really critical that he brings out is, because you, you're reducing the number of cores needed, right? those cores are available for other things, such as a reagent, uh, such as other, other functions that you can mm -hmm. do. By doing that, actually, it actually makes your the total throughput of the system better and latency mm -hmm. also gets reduced. Yeah. Right. So it, it goes back to the point that Karim mentioned. Two points: if you can 
reduce the copies, then you can reduce latency. If you can reduce the number of cores, now those cores are available for you to do other things. And, and as long as you do those two things well, you will get really good performance. Yeah. One, one, one other short question. Sure. What's, your, what's your packet drop rate? Because we've, we've found that just doing a simple spirant test, yep. the, pa the throughput at a 10 to the minus 6 versus a 10 to the minus 5 yep. is vastly different. And without quoting the packet drop yep. rate, these numbers are useless. No, so it so happened our lead architect for this uh, solution is sitting right there, Vinod Chegu. Yep. And he was the one, uh, you know, his team running all these tests. Hi. Uh, so this was done using RFC 2544. And that by definition, in RFC 2544, you do this whole range of packet sizes with zero packet loss. Okay, okay. That's, the requ that's the requirement for RFC 2544. Okay. And, and so, but I appreciate your questions because, you know, what, what we're trying to do over here is that right now, some of the latency and some of the questions that you were asking, what, what the equipment providers are doing today is that this entire thing runs on bare metal today. So all the latency associated with you know, packet coming from here and going and hitting the, the NIC edge, that is the part we're trying to optimize as much as possible. Within this, what's happening, it's essentially, we're trying to say that the, the, the guys who were building these, these VMs, they, were, they weren't VMs, these were physical boxes sitting separately. Now you're putting them in here, and the shorter you can make this to the edge, edge then you are essentially being able to replicate what is happening in the, in the physical world. And our effort over here is, that's why we said that one of the carrier grade requirement is that you've got to be able to get as close as possible to the bare, bare metal speed, which is what we are focusing on. Then there is DVR as well, which should at least reduce yeah. some L3 latency, but come beyond, yeah. uh, so, you know, come beyond yeah. the data center. And, and we're going to be around, so happy to have a conversation with you. So, any so other? Much. Comments or questions? Oh, thank you very much.